There we go. All righty, week 35. Yay. So this is day 235 to 241. Oh, wait a minute. No, this is week 36. I pulled up the wrong notes. We don't want to do that one again. Wait, where did my week 36 go? Huh. Somehow it has not sunk in here. So let me pull it up on my iPad. Oh, wait, no, that's still not it. I have notes. Hold on. <laughs> I'll just have to pull them up over here. They're not pulling up there. Okay. Get this out of the way so I can see. All righty, guys, this is really odd. Let me see if they're in a different place because I have all my notes and they're not showing up. And I literally just finished adding something to them, so. That's very odd. Maybe God doesn't want us to do this today. I am. Found them. They're in a totally different place, though. That's kind of odd. Okay. How about I start over? Because <laughs> we don't want all that on the recording. Okay. <laughs> all right. So we are week 36. <laughs> and that would be days uh, 242 to 248. Um, so we have um, 117 more days to go. We've got 16 more weeks and we still only have 29 books completed because we've been in Ezekiel all week. <laughs> so 37 more books to go. And this week was Ezekiel 13 to 30. So yes, a whole week with Ezekiel. And um, it is so good and so rich. But I'm kind of like I was a couple of weeks ago with Jeremiah. I just need some good news. You know, it is just so sorrowful to read a lot of this. And um, I, I don't know um, if you guys have been thinking it, but Tim and I have been talking about it the, this last week as we've been reading stuff. And there are just so many parallels that you're reading in this and the way things were as to kind of the way we are headed as countries, uh, as humans. and um, it's sad, alarming, uh, throw whatever adjective you want to put in there, but, um, I don't know, anybody else noticing that as you're reading through this? Yep. Yes. I'm pretty sure I've highlighted some things because I'm like, oh, that sounds like today, what the world we're living in. So, yeah. Very good. Yeah, it does. Um, and I mean, I've got some notes, but I would almost rather, I, I just, let me burn through these notes really quickly. And then let's talk about what is standing out to you guys that you're going, oh my goodness, that, I see that around me. Um, so if, if I'll just start with chapter 13 real quick. And um, most of my notes this week have either come out of the Archaeological Study Bible or Haley's Bible Handbook. Um, and in 13, he's just talking about false prophets and evidently there were quite a few false prophets in Jerusalem, but also even among the exiles and they were prophesying to them. It's all going to be okay. Y'all are going to be good. What you want is going to happen. Don't believe what they're hearing. And I'm telling you folks, I'm hearing the same stuff from some prophets right now. And I want to hear good news. Yes. I want to hear good news. But I'm not hearing a call to repentance. I'm just hearing the person you want for president is going to be in. And the, this is going to, you know, I mean, it's, there's got to be some calls to repentance as well. 
and and it's not about our president do we see these guys talking about our president i mean talking about their i mean he, they're pointing people back to god and that is what is so important is we've got to make sure that we are following people that are pointing us to god and to trust in god and um and we're just seeing a lot of stuff of, of, of other prophets, other voices out there that are actually pointing us to some other directions. And uh, you, you just need to turn from that as quickly as you can. I mean, yes, I'd like for certain people to be the leader of our country or for whatever, you know, whatever. I, but I've said, because I've read the end of the book, it's got to get darker for the light to shine brighter and for us to be in that revelation period and for the Lord to come back. I don't want to be uncomfortable. I really don't. I like comfort. I'd like to have food and energy and, um, you know, all the things that I need, but I know God will still take care of me. Even if there's crazy chaos going around, going on around me. And he may need that chaos, just like we saw on 9-11. I think somebody even brought that up last, um, maybe last week or the week before. Yeah, Vicky did. Yeah. When those towers fell, all of a sudden, everybody went, oh, this is not good. Maybe we do need to go back to church and we do need to look for the Lord. And we do, you know, and it brought a, a small period of repentance and God may need for some things well, to go on it go ahead, also Lisa. united everyone you didn't care if you were republic or democrat or what it united us and now we are totally yep. divided yep yep definitely and it seems like every day we get more and more and more divided um we find another reason to be divided so so anyway that that Thir chapter 13 was really him talking a lot about and calling calling out about the false prophets and so I just encourage you as I've said even about anything that I teach you in this if you go back to the word and it what I say doesn't line up with that or what a prophet says doesn't line up with the word or what a pastor says in in a pulpit or whatever the word is the truth and that's where you have to go and you measure everything by what the word says. And, um, and we're very blessed that we have copies of the word. You know, they didn't, they had to go to the temple to, to have it read to them. They didn't just have a copy on the coffee table at home to read. So they were trusting in these prophets to give them words from the Lord, but we actually have it that we can study it and we can go back and look and see what it says. And does that line up with it? So um, I didn't really have any notes on chapter 14. Chapter 15 was a, the parable of the useless vine. And, you know, a lot in the Bible, it talks about um, us being vines and us being um, uh, fruitful plants and so basically this parable is just talking about because of all just the um, horrible sin uh, that Jerusalem has sunk to, they have become this unfruitful vine. And an unfruitful vine is not fit for anything. You can't use it to make a tool or to do anything else with except to burn it for fuel. And we know that the prophecies are that Jerusalem will burn. So basically they have gotten to such an unfruitful, terrible place that the only thing left is to use them as fuel for fire. That is so sad to me to think of being at a point where I'm good for nothing, but just God to burn me. I, that would be terrible. Um, let's see, chapter 16 was about the unfaithful wife and, um, you know, we see a lot of uh, metaphors in the Bible of, of the relationship between God and his people as husband and wife. And, um, you know, we had the whole book of Hosea um, where God even instructed him to marry Gomer and her, knew she was going to be unfaithful to him as a portrayal of 
how Israel has been with God. And so this, this particular chapter is about the same thing. It's very graphic, um, vivid portrayal of Israel's idolatry. Um, but it also talks about just how much the husband loved her and that he made her like a queen and he lavished on her silks and beautiful things. And that's kind of what we saw with Israel. I mean, God gave him the choices land and he blessed them and they were fruitful. And let's think about what they were like under David and Solomon. Yet, instead of being this beautifully loved bride who appreciated and was grateful for her husband and what all her husband had done and trusted in her husband, instead, she went to the idols of her neighboring countries, which would be like having adulterous relationships um, with these other men. And she prostituted herself. Um, and it goes so far as saying that she even outdid Sodom and Samaria in their wickedness. So I think I brought it up last week that um, Ezekiel is a hundred and something years after he's prophesying in the time that is a hundred and something years after the northern kingdom, Samaria, has fallen. Um, so in that hundred and something years, you know, Samaria was always a little bit worse <laughs> than Judah was, but now Judah has sunk to being even more wicked than the northern kingdom was. Um, so that's kind of what we're seeing there. And in the archaeological study Bible, it said, and remember from our studies in Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Genesis, that the prescribed punishment for adultery is death by stoning or burning. And what is going to happen to Jerusalem? It's going to burn. And so God is actually passing the judgment that was given to them back in Deuteronomy, Leviticus, Genesis. That So Jerusalem is going to burn. Um. See, chapter 17, we have a, an interesting parable of the two eagles. Um, and a few notes that I found on that, just hopefully it helped you, uh, you know, if you, if you go back and look at it. The first eagle that it's talking about in verse three is actually the king of Babylon. Um, the topmost shoot from verse four is probably talking about Jehoiachin, which is the, the, king that was 18 when he took the throne lasted three months and then um uh gave himself up to babylon so that jerusalem would not be destroyed and if we remember now that we've read about all the rest of the kings that came after him the what three or four more that came after him they all ended up dying he is the only one that actually remained because he actually did what Jeremiah had said, which was give yourself up to Nebuchadnezzar and follow him and you will survive. And so he was taken into exile and, and ended up surviving. And then when Nebuchadnezzar's son, evil Murdoch, um, becomes the king, he releases Jehoiachin from prison and lets him eat at his table for the rest of his life. And this is the shoot that we're still going to have um, the Messiah come from. Okay, so that is the, the remnant there that, that David's throne is still going, somebody on David's throne is still going to be there. So that's the tender shoot, topmost shoot, sorry. Um, and then the seed of the land is probably Zedekiah, who is our last king. And, um, and then the other eagle in the story is Egypt. And so it's talking about that <clears throat> the um, seed of the land looks to the, the second eagle. And you remember Zedekiah, actually, he's supposed to be this um, vassal king for Babylon, but he decides maybe to pair up with Egypt and maybe they can overrun Babylon together, which is a bad move because when that happens, Nebuchadnezzar calls, calls the end to it and takes Jerusalem so um <clears throat> those are who all the parts kind of were in the parable of the two eagles uh let's see if there was anything else I had on that <coughs> oh and I think the other the other little um 
word picture that is used in that one is the tender spring um, or tender sprig, sorry. Um, and that is actually the later plant that is going to come from Jehoiachin because he's um, remained. And then through that, the line of David will be um, restored and we'll have the fulfillment of the Messiah. So that was 17. In chapter 18, he just goes over the sins of Israel. Um, and we actually see Ezekiel go over those many times. And um, one of the notes that I read was that especially among the exiles, the generation of the exiles, they were not really taking the blame on themselves. They were trying to point back to their fathers, uh, to the ones that were still there <clears throat> and say, you know, this is all their fault. And one of the things that Ezekiel is sharing with them is that you're worse than your fathers. You guys just continue to sink lower and lower and lower, which is one of the things I think um, that, you know, we've been seeing as we're reading stuff that we're going, oh, okay, that reminds me of us. I mean, it's like with every generation or every few years, we swing really hard towards more acceptance of things and even if we swing back a little bit we never go all the way back so every time we swing we're swinging further and further and further into sins and idolatries and things that are accepted and um, all that kind of stuff and that's what he's telling these people he says you don't even see how much you've sunk you're worse than your parents were so stop pointing fingers at them um, so I think that's a, um, something that we could really look at for us too and just say, gosh, what would our parents or our grandparents have thought about some of the things that that we accept now? I mean, some of the stuff we have on TV. My mama would have been horrified <laughs> at, you know, things that are just, you know, that are I'm on. Horrified. I, <clears throat> But even at the eight, you know, well, I'm not even talking about having to go to HBO anymore. You know, that used to be if you were going to go watch some things, HBO. But now it's even on your normal channels in the evenings, which was family, you know, TV. There's all kinds of things portrayed there. We don't watch TV, so I can't, I'm not even sure what all the shows are and stuff that are on now. But I hear enough things that I'm like, ooh, okay. Um, so it is, I mean, I think it's just definitely one of those things that we, um, we need to consistently ask ourselves uh, are, you know, what do I accept now that maybe I shouldn't be extinct of? Um, so, uh, then chapter 19, um, is a lament. Uh, over the fall of David's throne. And um, it's using the imagery of a lioness, um, which is used quite a bit, the lion of Judah, all that kind of stuff. Um, David's family, you know, it was this great and powerful family. Now it has been overthrown. Um, the first cub that's mentioned in verse three is Jehoahaz. And he was actually taken um, to Egypt uh, in exile. And then the second cub mentioned in verse five was, um, probably either Jehoiachin or Zedekiah, but both of them were taken to Babylon. So it's talking about that. Um, you know, it's just this lament over David's throne being empty in Jerusalem now, and that these Kings have been even taken away to Egypt and to Babylon. And so there's no one sitting on his throne. In fact, it's going to be burned and destroyed. So very sad and um you know we know that we still have a messiah that is coming from that but it kind of looks like the promise that god gave of someone always sitting on david's throne you know someone from david's bloodline always being on the throne um it, it's kind of hard to see how that is gonna happen for them because they're getting glimpses of the messiah but we see those glimpses a whole lot better when we're reading it because we have the hindsight and they're like what is he talking about? A king that will last forever, huh? So it's uh, definitely a little different from the, for them as they're hearing these. Uh, chapter 20 was a review again of Israel's idolatries. Um, 
and just and it and it talks about generation after generation them just wallowing more and more and more in the filth of idol worship um in in chapter 20 it actually talks about um it refers to god's requirement that israel dedicate to him every firstborn male now i want to read this scripture from exodus to you exodus 13 2 and this is where god is is requiring that commitment he, but this is how he puts it consecrate every firstborn to me the first one to come from the womb among the israelites whether person or animal is mine he didn't say kill them sacrifice them he said they are mine in my service consecrate them consecrating is actually a very beautiful thing but then we have two israelite kings ahaz and manasseh if you remember these two guys and under them they took that scripture and that law and they radicalized it well yeah they radicalized it into a different law that required not the consecration of your firstborns but the sacrifice of your firstborn and I think we talked about this a while back. Part of the sacrifice to Moloch was they had um, these big statues with arms, with fire, and they would literally lay these children live on the burning arms and burn them in the fire. And to them, that was fulfilling this law of God requiring them to give them their firstborn that's where we have sunk to with israel when we're talking about generation after generation after generation just going deeper and deeper and deeper in the filth of their idol worship they are to a point that they have twisted the law so much they are sacrificing their firstborn children and manasseh that king sacrificed his own firstborn children who would have been the next king yet he sacrificed him to Moloch and to God this is just abhorrent I mean it is against everything that he stands for and that is never what he called for he called for the consecration so again this kind of goes back to what I was talking about at the beginning we have to read the word and read it rightly and not twist it to make it say what we want it to say or um get confused about it um and the the redeeming part of this particular chapter is that at the end of it we actually do get a glimpse of the coming restoration um through the messiah uh which is so good because everything else we're reading is just so bad it's like oh i need some happy news here um Let's see, chapter 21 is uh, basically just talking about, it's calling Babylon the sword, the sword of Babylon, how it's going to be used against Jerusalem and against Ammon. Ammon's pulled into this chapter. Um, and, you know, that the overturning of Zedekiah's throne is imminent, it's going to happen, and that this will be the end of David's kingdom. So we're kind of seeing this um, <clears throat> a couple of times through here. And then chapter 22, again, he's rehearsing the sins of Jerusalem. Um, you know, and some of the ones he points out are the idols, the idol worship, the shedding of blood, the profaning of the Sabbath, practicing robbery, uh, promiscuity and adultery. Um, and then it, he keeps saying this over and over again too: the, pri the princes, the priests and the prophets. Um, doing things uh for greedy gain dishonest gain and that is completely against god's commandments um charging people uh, uh a um not a fine uh, interest i couldn't think of the word charging them interest for a loan um that was against god's commandments you did not do that 
And uh, one thing I did read in the, um, I think it was the archaeological this week, it said in ancient societies, there are no records of like um, loans as we would know them now. People, uh, only the poorest of the poor would borrow money and they borrowed money to actually eat and clothe themselves. <laughs> it was not to buy houses or luxuries or things like that. So the people that would have had to borrow money were borrowing it to be able to live. And God commanded that you do not charge an interest to those people. You help your fellow Israelites. And, but they even had their priests and their kings and all their wealthy were really um, sticking it to, to the poor guy. And they were charging them very high interest rates and they were being um, very unjust and um, would imprison them and enslave them. And, you know, and, and if we remember that every seven years and then the, every 49 years, the, year, the years of Jubilee, especially on the 49th year, you're supposed to release people of their debts, give them their land back, give them their freedom back if they had had to sell themselves into slavery. And that was not happening. Um, the the wealthy were keeping people in slavery and not recognizing that and so to god that was about as bad as the idol worship that they were doing so that is a uh, 22 chapter 23 we go into um ula and ulaba the two sisters <laughs> Uh, who um, had this insatiable appetite for lewdness and um, promiscuity. And, and it's just another parable of Israel's idolatry. So Ula is, uh, is like the picture of Samaria and Ulaba is Jerusalem. And um, again, we see that husband and wife um, imagery there and how these two sisters have committed adultery adultery and promiscuity against God and one of the notes that I had this one might have been from Haley's yeah I think this was from Haley's Bible handbook it said because I mean we've had Isaiah talk about it we've had Hosea we've had Jeremiah we've had Ezekiel all talk about the whoring of um, Israel and um, and use these uh, promiscuous adultery pictures and they said because of that then it probably is showing us that there was rampant promiscuity and adultery being practiced it was very widespread practice within these well we in the pagan nations and then also within israel and judah and that's why the prophets use the picture so much because it is something that they could um, understand so this was not necessarily as shocking to them as it would be for us to read it because it's widespread practice there then in chapter 24 it moves into the cooking pot which was um, a little bit hard to follow um, so basically uh, when I was reading about it trying to understand a little bit better it was just saying that it's very, it was, uh, the cooking pot was symbolic of the destruction of Jew Jerusalem that was coming very near. And the rust on the pot represents all the bloodshed and the immorality of the city. And then the different pieces were in the pot. So, um, and then in this chapter, whoops, sorry, in this chapter, um, we also have the death of Ezekiel's wife. Um, and this one just, oh, I hated it, um, but God tells him, you know, the apple of your eye, the treasure, your treasure is going to die and you are not to mourn. And all of it is, ends up being a picture of Jerusalem and God having to let the treasure of his eye go without mourning it. And um, I mean, it's just a heartbreaking sign to these um, exiles that their beloved Jerusalem is going to fall and how heartbreaking for Ezekiel, you know, to lose his wife. And interestingly enough, it is three years 
from that happening to when Jerusalem actually falls. And he is in with silence for three years. It's not a short period of time. It is three years that he is not to say anything. I couldn't do that. But <laughs> that was that was just an interesting, interesting. I mean, the prophets are called to do some some hard tasks. Chapter 25 gets into Ammon, Moab, Edom, and uh, Philistia. These are all surrounding um, nations. And, and it's him letting them know, you may be cheering right now that Nebuchadnezzar is going to take Jerusalem down, but you guys are next. So don't cheer too loudly because he's coming for you all too, which he did. In fact, Philistia, he took that when he took Judah. Jerusalem and then it was like four years later and he invaded Ammon Moab and Edom so they all fell as well and then chapters 26 through 28 um, really goes into um, a lot of information about Tyre and um, so let me just read you a little information that I, I found so the visions of the doom of Tyre were given to Ezekiel in the same year that Jerusalem fell uh, but Tyre is going to fall a little bit later. And one of the things that Ezekiel prophesies is that there will be permanent desolation. And that was probably nowhere in the realm of possibility that for the people that lived in Tyre and for anyone who had visited there. Tyre was located 12 miles north of Israel at the Lebanese border. It was a double city. Um, they had one part of it was built on an island and the other part of it was on the mainland. It was very fertile, well-watered plain. Um, and they were the greatest maritime power at that point that had been. They controlled all the trade routes. Everything came through them and then back out. And so one of the things Ezekiel does is he's going through all these different things that ended, ended up being sold from other nations out of Tyre. So they were extremely wealthy. It was a very lavish, beautiful, beautiful city. The king's palace was on this island, so he felt like he was impenetrable. There was no way anybody was going to come take him on this island. And so for um, Ezekiel to be prophesying that Tyre's going to fall and that it would be left desolate was just kind of crazy um, as far as they were concerned. Um, like I said, it was renowned for its splendor and its fabulous wealth. Uh, let's see. But through Nebuchadnezzar's conquest and then um, later the Persians and Alexander the Great all came in because so Nebuchadnezzar took over Tyre, and then the Persians came in and took it, and then Alexander the Great. And by the time all of them had finished, they said it was literally left bare as a rock. And it was desolate, just like Ezekiel had said, which proves his prophetic um, gift. And um, in, let's see, verse 26 four through five and in verse um, 26, 14, I think Ezekiel actually calls it bare as a rock where fishermen spread fishnets and, um, and that it would never be rebuilt. And basically that is exactly what happened to this incredibly wealthy city that was just lavish and beautiful and nobody could, it didn't make any sense when he was, prophesying this but it came to pass in verse 30 29 and 30 um actually it's going to go on down into 31 32 or something there's about six visions that we see of um egypt we only read the first three of those six this week um and the first vision is just about egypt being pictured as a crocodile the monarch of the nile and <clears throat> that was also one of the gods of Egypt, the crocodile. Um, but it is just showing that Nebuchadne Nebuchadnezzar is going to invade Egypt and plunder this crocodile, plunder Egypt. 
And he does do that in 568 BC and that Egypt never truly recovers its former glory or power because it had been one of the world powers at that point. Um, and then the second vision is about 16 years, took place in 571 BC, about 16 years after the fall of Jerusalem. And it was about um, Nebuchadnezzar, when they defeated Tyre, they had sieged Tyre for 13 years. They'd locked them down. But a lot of people were able to sneak out with their wealth. So even though Nebuchadnezzar um, took over Tyre, a lot of the wealth was snuck out. And so he didn't get a lot of um, booty from that particular campaign. And so what Ezekiel is talking about here is that it's going to make up for it when King Nebuchadnezzar goes to Egypt because he is going to um, get uh, amazing wealth from Egypt that he didn't get from Tyre. So if it didn't make sense, that's kind of what he was talking about. Um, and then in the third vision, um, it's probably talking about, again, uh, the defeat of Pharaoh's army. And so we've got three more visions about Egypt that are going to be coming this next week. And that gets us to where uh, we read this week. But I am just really interested in hearing, like Lisa, I know you mentioned you've highlighted some things. Just what are some things that are standing out to you guys in this reading uh, with Ezekiel? I mean, I find it sort of depressing. <laughs> I, I mean, it is. <clears throat> yeah, I know. It's I would all, agree. I know it's all part of the part of the story of what God's trying to teach them and us of obeying His word and following Him and being more like Him. And trusting him. I think that's one of the things that are that's standing out to me is the only reason they ever started idol worship is because they didn't trust God. He wasn't doing it in their time and on their plan. So they went to other gods <laughs> to see if they might do it on their time and their plan. And we've got to trust God and his plan. I think my greatest in fear is there are too many people who do not believe and who are so against God and have no morals. It's scary. I, I feel like it sometimes we're, we're beyond the point that, you know, we've said for years, the Lord's coming back. This is it. But because I mean, I know we went through hard times years ago too, but this is way worse than what we've ever gone through. And I fear there's going to be a civil war within the United States. Very well could be. And, you know, Tim and I were talking about that the other day. We were like, is it going to be states against states? And we really think it's probably going to be urban against rural. Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, and, and in Atlanta, Stacey Abrams is going to churches and speaking about how uh, abortion is okay and nothing is said in the Bible about abortion. Well, what church would allow that? I, those pastors of those churches, they're going to stand before God and they're going to be the ones that will be, I mean, because they're opening their pulpit up and they are, they are the leader of that church and God puts them there and he will deal with them. But my main thing is, um, I am so, I feel for our children, our, what our children are being taught. And they're the next generation. Yep. Uh, Dulcie um, called me the other day and she's like, Mom, I maybe it's who I follow on social media. Have you seen the new Me Too thing? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she said, it's about um, sleepovers. So you know how in the kind of the Me Too, the first lady kind of came out and said, you know, um, 
my the director movie director was inappropriate and all that and then all these women kept going yeah i've had that's happened to me yes my boss did that to me me too me too me too well now the me too is i went to a sleepover and an older brother or a cousin or the father of the person that or that i was molested or pornography oh, or all this stuff and and all these are going me too me too and dulcie said well Adari and Ali can never forget <laughs> going to a sleepover that's not going to happen it is just crazy at um all the things. i wish churches would come together again and start rallies and pray for our nation and I mean something's got to happen like that I think or it's not going to get better it has bothered me for years um when especially when we were still back in Georgia and we would drive to church and I we would drive by I remember counting one time uh we were going to a church that was about an hour away. So we did have a ways to drive, but there was like 25 other teeny tiny little churches all along the way. And everybody, you know, and there'd be three cars in the parking lot, but they're paying rent and electricity and staff and all this and all these different things because people didn't get along, <laughs> you know? And so this one split off to do this and this one split off to do this. And it was like, why? can't we just take all of that finance and energy and everything and just love on people show the love of god and teach them his word we don't need the programs and we don't need the you know every single denomination and all this stuff it just i mean let's just get back to the word of god and lisa that goes to what you were just saying if we would just come together instead of building our own little kingdoms in these churches just come together work right. together it, it's gonna have to be huge and it's gonna have to be over every state in the united states that would do it i mean it, it's gonna have to be huge like one of trump's rallies <laughs> well one of unfortunately without the churches people are not gonna they're not gonna do this on their own no i mean nope. uh i know i mean Somebody that's not in the word, that's not studying the word, they've got to be encouraged. And that's what our churches are supposed to be doing, is, is teaching well, them, encouraging them. That's one of the things I love about this particular program. I mean, we're not in a church, but we're having church. I mean, we have church every week with us. And we're all learning things about the word that we've never seen before. So I think um, this is a great avenue to get people in the word, to learn those things. And then if we just had even more and more and more of these groups or bigger and bigger and bigger groups, what could we go out and do in our communities and bring other people in to read the word? And I'm not trying to build my community here. You want to start one of these next year? You go for it. You know, it's not going to no, upset me if you don't join me. mine. <laughs> but... <laughs> That's the, I mean, that's the, the point though, is we're not, we're not trying. And I don't think, I don't get the impression that Tara Lee is trying to build, you know, Tara Lee's kingdom. She's trying to just present the word that she absolutely right. loves reading and all these, this is the 10th time she's read the Bible through. And so she's sharing the stuff that she has learned from doing that. And but why aren't, think, why aren't our religious leaders doing something? Why aren't you know, they? If, if you've got to pay a mortgage and you got to pay salaries and you got to keep the electricity on and you got to do all these things, it makes it very difficult to stand up in the pulpit and say some of the things that you might need to say if you're concerned that you're going to run people off and they won't continue giving. Oh, yeah, especially the big churches. Yeah. So you put yourself in a very... Um, precarious situation with that you can't necessarily speak everything you need to speak well I and guess I, I guess I'm fortunate because I've never been in a church where the pastor has I mean that he yeah. says what he says and I'm I get I don't I I've never been in a church like that so I can't relate to that but I know that my biggest time of growing 
my children's biggest time of growing, the friends that we made that we still have was all done within our church. So I don't know. Yeah. So my Canada ladies, what do you guys experience there? And I know y'all have had so many lockdowns and stuff. What have, what have the churches, are they meeting again? Are they, what, I mean, what do you have going on up there? It's actually knitting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay we got both of you all right <laughs> i can't talk on the other ipad because uh there's too much feedback so oh, okay. i don't have a church that i go to here i mean i did when i was younger because i grew up roman catholic but what i've seen in my travels is church churches are open and okay. uh, so people are congregating in my church churches in my neighborhood um but I haven't actually been to, oh, I did actually, that's not true. A few weeks ago or a month ago, I was at a church up North and um, it was like normal. There wasn't anything, you know, COVID related or mask related or anything like that. That's but good. Y'all don't have the, y'all don't have religious leaders either that are going out in public and trying to change you know make some changes to what's going on with our elected officials because y'all got some bad stuff going on too just like we do yeah i don't i don't see anything as far as religious leaders but what i do see uh shockingly for me are are everyday people who are fighting against everything that's all these mandates and all these government um bullying um our normal people fighting against them and bringing God into it, which I've never seen before in my life. I don't know if it's because I didn't pay attention or I'm just seeing it now that they are bringing prayer and, and God into all of their fights. Yeah. In a positive way. So. Yeah, no, in a positive yeah. way. That's well, I, mean, I definitely think that's what it's going to take. I don't know what else we can't go on the way we're going well the comfort to all this is not nothing is a surprise to god <laughs> he knows the beginning from the end so he's not going oh my gosh i didn't know that covid thing was going to happen i didn't know it was going to set off a chain of all kinds of stuff i just didn't know no he knows it all and so our our um position now is that it is so important for us to carve out time not just to read the word every day that is we need to be spending time in his word but also just listening saying lord talk to me what do i need to do do i need to store up some food should i get solar should i not even worry about it should i whatever you know because he can show us the beginning from the end. He can show us what is going to happen. He can nudge us. And, um, but if we've got all this noise going on around us and we never just slow down and are quiet for a little bit and just talk with him, then we're not going to know what he's telling us to do. So that's, um, Tim and I've really, over the weekend, we actually, um, I put on our calendar uh, a couple of hours each day and we just sat and talked about future and what we felt like the Lord was kind of pulling us to or asking us to do or um, instructions that he was giving us uh, and we haven't we don't have the complete plan yet um, but it is interesting how some of the things that we're talking about <laughs> will come up in an article that we're reading and we're like, okay, that's kind of weird that we were just talking and praying about that. And now this over here is telling us we need to do blah, 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 blah. That kind of is what we that's, were thinking. That's because your, your phones are listening to you. <laughs> you do know that, don't you? Yeah, they but do. we were outside. So yeah, <laughs> you still had your phone in your hand. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so, but it, I would just, I mean, encourage everybody along with the time that you're spending in the, in the word and just, I mean, such kudos that you've gotten 36 weeks under your belt. I mean, that's amazing. And let's try to pull as many people as we can in to start with us on October 1st for the New Testament, because that's a smaller bite size for people to start with if they're thinking, I can't do a whole year. But if they could just do the New Testament and get a flavor for the Bible recap and reading chronologically and, and be introduced to the Bible Project videos and to, you know, Tara Lee's podcast. I mean, I just think it's, um, it's a good beginning. I mean, that's how I started last fall. And then I was like, yes, I want to do the whole thing because I learned so much during those three months. Um, so please, I mean, I've got the links and the emails. Tell people about it. Let's get as many people just to join us. And if they can't do the Zooms, that's fine. But if they're doing the podcast and the Bible project and they're reading the word, wow. And they're about to get all into Jesus. This is going to be, it is so good, guys. It is so good. You're going to love the New Testament. That's my thing. I keep thinking we're not that far. We're not that far. If I could just get through some of this more prophet stuff, I'm going to have Jesus. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we just have a couple more weeks. So, all right. Well, um, anything, any praise reports or prayer requests? Actually, let me, I'm going to pause our.